we're going to go ahead and get everything going here. So thank you everybody for coming today. My name is Megan Abella Bowen. I'm the Associate Dean here at the New Bedford campus. And I have the luxury of being able to work with Eva Brito, and we are working very hard to bring over more activities from the Women's Center over here to New Bedford and to support the women's initiatives here at the New Bedford campus. Um, so again, um, hopefully next year we will have additional programming that happens. Today we're doing the stories that inspire, and I'm going to ask Eva to come in and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, if you don't know me, my name is Lina Brito and I am the director of the Women's Center here at Bristol Community College and this is a partnership actually today in, with the New Bedford campus as well as the Multicultural Center that brought Austin and Jennifer that I'll introduce in a minute but I wanted to share a little bit about the Women's Center before I do that. We're actually located in the Fall River campus in the E building, E104. I'm holding one of the pamphlets because they're outside so if you want to know more about us you can. Um, our actual site offers a lot of different things. Um, but let me step back, why is there a Women's Center? It's really a space to support all students, regardless of how you identify, to have conversations that empower, authentic conversations, and really look at this dynamic world we live in and how we support women. Um, in doing so, we have a professional closet there that has both male and female clothing. So if a student has an event, like an interview or some sort of professional event, and they don't have the money, or they can spend the money on the on the clothing, they can go there. Everything's donated, and we have a lot of nice stuff. A lot of it is new, and you can take it home, and thank you for all the donations that we find. We also have a quiet area, study area, so you can go there and get your homework done if you don't um, want to go to the library. We have a resource table with a lot of different agencies. Uh, family planning agency, if you're familiar with them, they have a site in New Bedford as well in Fall River. They come every Monday from 10.30 to 11.30 and they uh, focus on sexual health so you can get an STD test, you can get a pregnancy test, and the great thing is we're right next door to the nurse's office so they use one of the medical rooms there so that happens as well. We have a lactation room which is new too so if you're a parenting student you can use our lactation room and we have a fridge so you can leave the milk there, go to class and come back. Uh, we have a lending library that has a lot of cool books in there. So we have a lot to offer. We're creating the program. We really want your student input and we want to grow. And part of our growing is partnerships with the New Bedford campus and other campuses. Um, Megan Bellaboa has been awesome as a partner. So thank you, Megan, for all your support. And one of the series we have is today, Stories That Inspire. It's an opportunity to hear someone's story. I believe that stories are the bridge to our humanity. So um, hopefully you'll hear something that inspires you. And I know um, personally as a good friend um, that Jennifer is very inspiring. She's an activist. She recently got her PhD and just an awesome warrior woman. So I'll let her tell Thank her story. You. I do want to say it's an informal type environment. Feel free to ask questions. It's really the thought process to have an intimate conversation with someone that you can hopefully learn from and build with. Thank you. Going to give it up for Eva. She's a phenomenal woman herself. I'm also inspired by her and some other people in the room. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, just to start with a brief introduction, I just want to kind of compliment um, and reinforce what Eva said about this being a conversation. I'm very much a person that's into dialogue. I'm not really good. I'm, I can do it if I have to, but the one talking at thing is uh, a very boring thing for me so I really like conversation so please feel free at any time if you have a question if you miss something or whatever this is a conversation this is that's what this is um, I will start with a brief introduction about myself and a little bit about my story in hopes that that drops a little bit of seeds of inquiry for you or things that you may think about or be inspired by I'm just curious how many people here hi Peyton <laughs> are um, students Cool. Would you mind coming up front? Yes, you. Beautiful. Yes. Um, my main motivation for being here today is the students of Bristol Community College. Um, and I just want to be able to see your shine, girl. That's all. Um, but I, I would just really like to communicate um, because I'm an alumni, alumna of uh, Bristol Community College. And you'll hear that as part of my story. Um, so I'm very proud to come here today. I love this place, and the people in this place are amazing. Um, and I can get into that as well as part of my story here. But I'm really here for the students. I love everyone else, too. Um, and I hope to you know, be helpful and resourceful to everyone in the room. But I, I really have a special place for 
every uh, BCC student. Um, so basically, again, my name is Jennifer DeBarrows. I was born and raised here in New Bedford. How many born and raised here in New Bedford? Oh, okay. Um, so born and raised here, um, primarily in the West End neighborhood. You know, when we talk about New Bedford, it's always like, where are you from? North End, West End, South End. Um, primarily West End, but I did move a lot around um, in the South End and the North End as well. Um, I was born at St. Luke's Hospital. Um, my mother was 18 when she had me, a single mother. Um, so with that being said, there were a lot of, um, you know, challenges very early on in my life as I was coming into the world. Um, those challenges became a lot more severe um, once my mother became an alcoholic and turned to drinking to cope with a lot of the traumas in her life. Her mom had passed away. She was very stressed as a single mom. My sister was born uh, with cere cerebral palsy. Um, just a lot of stresses in the family and that really had an impact. One on a powerful impact in terms of really making me very loyal to my family, to being a nurturer and a caretaker, and also having a lot of challenges very early on in terms of responsibilities and things that I had to take care of. Um, with that being said, I think around adolescence, um, let me just back up, I'm also proud of Connie Academy. Uh, that's a place where I, I grew up in the townhouses, so being a part of the Connie Academy community was very, very, uh, powerful and transformative for me so I just want to sometimes I jump to middle school let me just back up a little bit um, being in that school was really really helpful it was under the leadership of Dr. Waters um, and it was a, a, an experience where we sang a song you know and a lot of us still know the song we sing the song uh, every morning it was a way of giving us a sense of pride in who we were and being part of a community we use the word brotherhood and I think if we translate that language now we're talking about diversity and community. Um, so we were like, oh, brotherhood, that's so patriarchal or whatever. <laughs> We've evolved, I guess, as a, as a community. Um, but that sense of brotherhood meant coming together, everyone, you know? So we had a song that really, you know, sowed those seeds and those values and the teachers and the leadership also echoed those values at Carney Academy at that time. So that was a very powerful school and I'm very proud of that school. And if you notice, I'm going to highlight a lot of the educational aspects of my life. Um, so coming through adolescence, I feel, was kind of like the, the testament of all time. And I've, I've, I always tell young people that it's the most pivotal point, I think, when you're heading into middle school, junior high, because you're really going through a lot of changes individually, um, psychologically, physiologically, um, socially. There's a lot of things happening to young people um, as you're transitioning in. You're trying to be, discover who you are but you're also highly influenced um, as well. So I think um, going into Keith Junior High, I think I was questioning a lot about who I am, what I, what I, um, what I wanted to do. Um, and honestly, my, my vision for myself was not very big <laughs> um, because I was a caretaker. I didn't feel um, like, a, like on the home front. I didn't really think outside of my family box. Um, I didn't really think I didn't realize at the time I was probably dealing with depression. Um, as, as I became an adult, I kind of realized that when I started seeking um, some, some support. Um, but really, at that time, as much as I may have been performing well in school and doing okay socially, I definitely had a self-destructive kind of belief about myself. A lot of like hopelessness, a lot of not really thinking about myself, it was more, what can I do for everybody else? And I ended up getting into a relationship <laughs> um, pretty early on. Um, and my, my parenting, where my father was not really involved in my life, my mother was, as much as she had her issues, she was a hard worker, constantly working two, three jobs. Um, so I was left to man, man the fort and didn't really have a lot of guidance and stuff. So I think that I had a lot of like, and, and reflection, I didn't know then, a lot of abandonment and neglect issues um, that I was challenged with. And I feel, as a young person, we don't really understand what's happening to us. We don't really make sense of it, and oftentimes we personalize it. It's my problem, something's wrong with me, I don't know uh, what I'm, I don't, I don't know, like just really becoming self-destructive and really hopeless. And I think hopelessness is really the seed 
for a lot of decisions uh, uh, that we make, not really thinking ahead. When you don't have hope and you can't see beyond, you're really lo looking at the moment, you know, at, at the here and now. So I really put myself at risk. I um, displaced all of my voids and, and gaps and pain into a relationship very, very young. And I think, you know, out of the strength of Eva, like coming out of the Women's Center, is that as young women, a lot of times we put our value outside of ourselves. We look for the, the partner. We look for um, the parental or caretaker role. We don't really look at who we are. I didn't even know who I was um, at this time, but already making decisions that will clearly define uh, where I will end up. So I ended up becoming a mom at 15 years old. Um, and the, the journey, I think, for me was, you know, being in this, this relationship, it was like, that was the void. And he was three years older than me. He was 16. I was 13 when I met him. And I'm expecting a 16-year-old to, like, <laughs> fill all these voids and be the, I don't know. My friends here could tell you a lot about that story on the sidebar. <laughs> um, but spent 10 years, two kids later, you know, in that relationship, but really putting a lot of, ideas around I am supposed to be his woman, I am supposed to accept whatever because of my children, I am, you know, supposed to just not think for myself, only think of what everybody else needs, including my, my sister. Um, my, we were very close. I took care of her a lot and as growing up. So um, I ended up dropping out of school. Um, and it wasn't because I was failing. I had A's and B's. It was mainly because when I transferred over from New Bedford High, actually I was in my 10th grade, my 10th year, sophomore, I transferred over to parent and teen program. Has anyone ever seen the, seen the school been there? It's currently at the old Vogue on Hillman Street, but it used to be right up here at the school department and there wasn't an elevator. And what I loved about it is I could bring my son with me. Um, but it was a challenge without an elevator because you have three flights of stairs. We were all the way up the top. You had the carriage, the diaper bag, your book bag, the binky rolled down what street? William Street. And I was like, oh no, like he's gonna have to go without this binky because I'm about to be late and we got three flights of stairs to climb up. Um, but he was like right there, you know, and I was, I'm sorry, I hit the wire. Okay. I was able to um, finish 10th grade, but when I got into 11th grade, the curriculum was the same as it was last year. And I was kind of a B kind of student. And I was really not inspired by the education there. And I said, why am I here? Like, it's great that my son is here with me. Um, but I decided to drop out and, and get my GED. And at that time, and I, they may still have this component, but that school had that option. You could still go prepare for the GED test, or you can go and get your, your high school diploma. And I just did not feel inspired. And I think, you know, as we have these discussions later, that that's a, that's a whole topic in itself, right? If one, being pushed out of the regular school, two, being in a school, which is great because you can have your child, but your the, the investment in that resource of having the curriculum or the instruction that I need to inspire me. College was never in my mindset, ever. Um, but here comes the good part. So I got my GED. My son was born in 92. And I, my class was 94. Go ahead, Jody. Woo -woo. That's my friend. She got to graduate. We went to her graduation. But I ended up enrolled in BCC before she graduated. <laughs> so I was in college um, at BCC, and oh my goodness, I felt, okay, let me just put this in perspective for you students. I rode a big yellow bus that would park outside the health center with a bunch of other students. There was no New Bedford campus, and we would all ride on this yellow bus like little kids. <laughs> and when I stepped on the campus, I just was in awe because I, I was like, this is not what I thought college was. This is what education should look like. I had teachers that were very engaging, very responsive, very involved in what I was doing. I was able, I was like, BCC should come before New Bedford High. That was my thought process. <laughs> because I would have never touched 
the campus. I would have, I never thought I would go to school. And the only reason why I did is because I said to myself, my son, I'm not going to be able to take care of him with a GED. And now that I don't have a high school diploma, I need to up it to a degree because I need to do the next step. That was my only motivation. Um, but to actually be on the campus and understand what college was on a community college level, there's nothing like it in the world. And I just really, really want to bring that home, like be proud of being here and all the stuff that you're doing as students because this is a phenomenal place. And I left here without debt too, by the way. Um, <laughs> that's a whole nother story. But like, it's, it's really a quality experience around, across the board. Um, and I wanted to do art, and my mother was like, you're not going to get a job pursuing art. You need to do something else. And I said, okay, I'll just be a medical secretary. <laughs> How do you make that job? I, I don't know. I felt that I could get a job. And the funny thing. I feel like working in medical, like the first thing you don't think is a secretary. Like that, I feel like that's such a such weird jump from like, let's do art to medical secretary. It is. <laughs> it, was, it was ideal dream to practical reality. And the funny story is I went through, um, it was the business and information management office, Godwin Araguzo, God rest his soul. He was my, my, the leader of um, that division and um, I was a work study student there. Um, but I went through all of this. What I liked was the medical stuff, like the terminology, the biology, that was cool. And I don't know if anyone knows what stenography is. Um, but it's like shorthand and all this stuff. I, it doesn't matter in life anymore. <laughs> the computer was actually black with green letters. This is like putting things in context. Y'all are very lucky. You can do your homework right here on your phone. Um, so I went through the experience and ended up having a co-op. Has, has anyone have the co-op thing going on? Yes? Oh, so that means you're graduating soon, right? No, I didn't in high school. Oh, okay. I wouldn't know if you were doing it here. So the co-op, I don't know if it's still an institutional thing, but basically once you get to a certain phase, you go into the community and you work at different places to um, get to, uh, references, but skills, and like sometimes there's payment involved, but typically not. So I went around all these little doctor's offices and no one would take me for a co-op. I don't know why, I just think it was divine because they ended up placing me at a special place called Treatment on Demand. And Treatment on Demand was a nonprofit organization that was working to confront the twin epidemics of substance abuse and HIV, um, but also cultivating a whole section of youth leadership. This, this woman right here was on the board at what, 18, 19? Very young on the board. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna keep integrating people into the story. Um, so uh, treatment on demand, yes. Yeah, so I landed there and I was only supposed to go to help with their office staff because I'm a secretary now, right? <laughs> um, and what ended up turning out is there was someone who saw something in me I could never see. Someone who totally believed in me and saw potential. I'm still trying to maximize that potential that that person saw in me. Um, and his name is Gerald Ribeiro. Um, and he has since passed away, but I feel like I'm sharing this because um, for the adults in the room, how important it is to really be in a young person's life. Um, because that was a very transformative time. So for me, just going to, I'm gonna get this little degree, go work at a doctor's office and get a job and take care of my son to me transforming into hold on, I am uh, capable I have a vision, I have hope, I found my passion. And it was working in the community, specifically with young people, but Treatment on Demand was very cross the board with different kinds of people, different ages, and all different backgrounds. Um, but, but having that mentorship and having someone believe in you and being willing to invest in you um, was very, the most pivotal point in my life and the reason why I stand here today or sit here today at this table. Um, so he, as much as I was, you know, typing notes and doing all these things, he, it's so weird. Wow, the universe is crazy. So this room used to be um, rented out by Child and Family Services way back in the day. And um, they had this grant called the Impact Grant and it was a teen pregnancy prevention grant. 
that's when we were grant happy. There was a tobacco grant, a <laughs> oxygen grant, a, there was every kind of grant to do every kind of thing in the prevention field. But it was in this office, they had the Impact Coalition, and they were subcontracting out, and Gerald said, Jennifer, I want you to, to lead this. I want you to be the program director of our, uh, we, it was the Youth Empowerment Program at the time. So here I am, very young, being placed into a leadership role and being able to um, work with young people. And as much as it was about teen pregnancy prevention, how can I be talking about that? <laughs> I didn't prevent it. But anyways, my story, being able to see how my story was not just an individual story, it was a collective story. And it was something that wasn't a personal problem, but it was a societal problem. And I wouldn't even put it in the context of a problem, but a challenge, um, because it's a very multi-layered thing when we talk about some of the issues that we face um, in the community. But basically, um, being able to lead and have programs and be you know, involved in the community, the love and the reinforcement and the modeling and that, I was 19 at the time. And it, it was just a very, very powerful thing. Um, they had a coalition for needle exchange um, that I saw the whole city come together on a very controversial issue, but stand behind people who, who are often stigmatized and disenfranchised and the people that came to that table the, the diversity and the things that they, re they represented was amazing. So I was able to bear witness to a lot of hope and possibility. And with that, I decided I'm going to go back to school for sociology. You, can you dig that one? The jump? Yeah? I can see that. Okay. All right. <laughs> the arts thing, uh, always in me. And I guess I can get into that a little bit more. But So went back to school for sociology at UMass because I'm like, yes, I love people. I love social movements. I love... Um, trying to be a solutionary, trying to you know create solutions, inspire people, get people engaged. That was my thing. And um, through that time, um, just really, really getting involved in so many things. My children were at meetings, uh, like things were in my living room. We were having study groups there, reading Paulo Freire and uh, People's History of the United States. We were just a lot of community-based efforts of really trying to, a dance troupe, I pulled my car up, blasted the speakers, and we rehearsed in Kearney Academy parking lot. Um, there are a lot of things, being in a play uh, for colored girls, uh, <laughs> you know, there's just so many things, just constantly being engaged in your community. So here we have mentorship, right? And being engaged in your community. I think those are, those are some takeaways from today. So far, there may be some more as we, as we go forward, but really, um, really being involved and in how inspiring, it was infectious. It was out of control, a little unhealthy, actually, because it just didn't stop, you know? Um, and just really being passionate about wanting um, better, you know, for your people, for your community. So I ended up eventually moving up in the organization. So I started as the youth, uh, the program director of the Youth Empowerment Program, and then eventually, through other roles, became the director of services. So here I am, younger than all my staff. <laughs> They're looking at me like, oh, what's this young person going to tell me? A lot of challenges there. Um, but we, run a, we, we ran the Billy Qualls Community Center on Kempton Street. And through that, um, we did some very powerful programs recognized by the, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, uh, just very phenomenal time, but really looking at leadership, right? And just like understanding my role as an individual and how I can turn my adversity into something positive and constructive and engage other people in that, in that transformational process. So, um, I was there for a long period of time and eventually transitioned out to work for the Impact Coalition at Child and Family, who was at the Zaitarian at the time on the top floor. Um, and really looking at the coalition as a whole and subcontracting and really like trying to get a youth committee established there. My thing was always about bringing young people to the table and decision making and implementation all, of, all across the board. Um, and I think one of the pivotal things, I lost a lot of people to, to violence 
My cousin passed away, a close friend of mine. Sorry. And I think um, we walk around these streets, we do our things, we do, you know, all, all of these things are happening, but there's a lot of pain and trauma in our communities. And I, there was a time when somebody was dying every holiday within a year. People remember? People know? People who've been here? Um, so, it's, it's real, it's present, and I'm gonna honor this. Um, because we don't, we don't acknowledge what our students go through, what families go through. When you go through a loss, and just loss in general, like when Gerald passed away, I could have planned for that because he was chronically ill, but I still wasn't prepared when he passed. But when it's a tragic loss and it's so vicious and there's no accountability and there's just a lot of wounds and stuff that go there, like we expect people to just keep it moving, go back to work, sit down, take this MCAS or whatever test, be quiet, be still. And I think like, you know, I had to step out. I had to move. I moved to Florida for a few years because I didn't want my sons to believe that that was normal to see shrines everywhere around the block and every holiday someone's dying. And it was just a really big deal and uh, something that as young black males, um, internalize and believe that's their fate. And I think even even still a lot of, they may even still think that is their fate just because of what we see every day. So I feel like um, we need to be in, in present, like be present with that, you know, make that present, like this history of generations of pain and that ongoing cycle of suffering um, and how that manifests in everything that we do, how we look at each other, how we treat each other. Um, it's, 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 um, anyway, so I ended up going to Florida and trying to show my sons, I can say it was a little selfish because I love the sunshine and I need the sun in my life, um, but just to take them out of the element a little bit and be around grass and long roads and uh, a different reality, slowed pace. Um, my oldest one wasn't very happy about that. But while I was there, I ended up working with a lot of youth organizations and went to a, a HBCU, Historically Black College, um, Bethune-Cookman University, Wildcat. Um, and so I transitioned from UMass in sociology and I just, because when I was at UMass, I was so entrenched in this community, I could not get the education piece done. It was like one class here, two classes there, maybe three up, I'm gonna drop it. It was a never ending story in getting this bachelor's degree, probably like a 10 year, I don't know. If I sit down and do the math of how long it took me, I, don't, I couldn't even tell you. Um, you say 90, I, I graduated 2010 with my bachelor's. So we're talking about 90s, right? 98, oh, my, my youngest son was born in 98. Um, so it took a long time, but when I went to, to Florida, I said full-time. I'm going to school full-time, and I worked full-time, and I just banged it out. I don't know how. <laughs> Everybody's like, how? You just do. You find a way, you just do it. And um, really without family supports, like our family, like we're very close and tight because we are our supports. And at the same time, we're trying to break generational curses and things that we're, you know, trying to model what we feel a family should be, um, which is often challenging and like lots of mistakes there <laughs> um, along the way, but really trying to really model what it means to be a sibling, what it means to be a mother, what it means to be a family, a unit, um, and really cultivating that there. Um, but full time, I graduated magna cum laude with, so, uh, with a sociology <laughs> um, a degree. And then my son graduated from high school and he was like, I'm out. He never wanted to be there. And he came back to New Bedford, so we all followed. 
I was kicking and screaming because he's a big part of the, the support system. Um, so we came back to New Bedford and it wasn't long after that, you'll appreciate this, I started working at Third Eye which is an arts-based organization. Yeah, so things kind of come full circle. But uh, even aside from Third Eye, I um, always had arts. I was always writing, performing, um, yeah. you know, like it was, and that's what I just realized. It's always going to be, like, hip-hop is my religion. Like, I'm always going to be expressing myself artistically in some way or form, even down to my dissertation, you know, even when I write. Um, so that's just maybe not doing art degree, but... I'm going to be an artist in other ways. <laughs> but yeah, so we're just turning back to um, Third Eye, just really, um, again, working with young people, looking at culture, but mainly youth development, like really trying to be there for young people. We had a, a youth development center. Um, we had all kinds of activities going on, all volunteer run. Um, I, f I got like one staff person like towards the end of my tenure there who helped manage a lot of our school-based programs, but we expanded out of New Bedford. We went into Taunton, Fall River, um, providing really culturally relevant and engaging programs. Um, Third Eye is mainly known for the Open, which is a festival, but we were th Third Eye 365 days a year. And we were there for young people, um, helping them navigate life, helping them uh, graduate high school, um, which was a big challenge. Um, so at that time, um, there was a lot of, uh, and there still is, uh, the funding is really, really challenging when you're in the nonprofit world, especially when you're coming up out of an organization that was founded by youth, um, that doesn't have the, you know, the leverage of old, established organizations that, uh, and not only that, I think the, the demographic that we served, <laughs> you know, it, it, it was hard for people to understand how and why to support Third Eye because it's like, what do you mean, hip hop? Like, what is this? And culturally, it didn't make sense um, to some people. And a lot of times funding, we didn't get a lot of the funding that most people got. Um, but I think when we, when we look at, um, the landscape at the time, when I talked about grants to do everything, um, there was a lot of cuts in prevention. Um, mainly, a lot of money shifted towards intervention, like crisis stuff or incarceration, even taken out of education, uh, public education. So we're looking at a climate that is very anti-human, <laughs> um, but also um, really having a hard time to, you know, keep the resources that we needed in the organization. So I stepped back and then started to pursue um, my doctorate degree at UMass Dartmouth in Ed Leadership and Policy Studies. And wow, like what a journey, like to go from never thinking, I, and I didn't even plan this, this is Ricardo Rosa's fault, if you're watching, it's all your fault. Um, Ricardo Rosa, another mentor of mine, he was a board member of Third Eye, and he would provide free Taekwondo classes out of our center. And he said, you know, you need to do this program. And I'm like, yeah, crazy. Like, I'm not, like, I was never thinking about any type of mass, any graduate education, master's, doctorate, nothing, never, ever, in my, my view. Um, so he made it very real for me. And like Gerald, he saw something I did not see. And then I said, Zoe, I think you need to come with me <laughs> on this journey. So Zoe came um, on the journey. Um, and it was um, an interesting journey because, one, the program that I was in really fed parts of who I was. Um, it was a social justice oriented program that looked at trying to create solutions. They were very, it was kind of bleak and depressing at times. Like, I'm like, I need therapy after class. <laughs> Um, but really about looking at transformation, like transformative leadership. How do we become leaders and look at the issues and not reproduce the status quo, this thing that we just keep reproducing out of comfort norm or whatever, uh, dictation, uh, stand, like standardized uh, guidelines by the state, whatever it is, um, but really starting to look at, you know, uh, critical theory, which I don't want to get too deep into theory here, but I ended up doing my project on um, my dissertation project on a police shooting of Malcolm Gracia. I don't know if anyone's heard of Malcolm Gracia. 
Um, but he was actually a part of the Third Eye family. He interned in exchange for studio time because he was an aspiring artist and he was killed by police in New Bedford. And my goal of that project, when we're here in inspiring stories, we're hearing stories is, I uh, did an oral history project of community members because when I go back to talk about that trauma and what happens when people lose people so tragically, understanding how impactful that was. Um, and no one returning to the community to check in, to help heal, or to, if anything, the youth became more criminalized um, and targeted. Um, so how these things just get perpetuated and how education plays a role in this trajectory um, and this whole culture of control when it comes to black bodies. Um, so um, that was my dissertation topic and it's more than just a topic for me because um, what was important to me was really bringing out the radical traditions of this city. A lot of our history is being erased. Gentrification is real. I don't care what anybody wants to say. I was at a meeting the other day and people are talking about gentrification and ways they need to really do some research. Um, but a lot of people don't know the rich radical traditions of our, of our city. You know, we hear about Frederick Douglass, you know, and we have these statues, but um, I just learned recently about Paul Cuffey, like the first Pan-Africanist here in this area, um, doing work way before Marcus Garvey or other people. So there's a whole legacy here around liberation, around abolition, around justice um, that we're losing <laughs> sight of, and I'm getting goosebumps. Um, and I think that was the main you know, piece of the story is that how do we return to our roots as a community, how do we address some of these things and, and bring our community back together again so that we can heal and that we can uh, prosper and actually be a community because um, we're becoming really fragmented. Um, so I think, you know, when I, when I think of Malcolm's stories, I had seven storytellers. I had a family member, his sister, an artist, uh, two young people who were there the day it happened. I had a retired police officer um, and someone who is a community member and organized around it after it happened, a, a rally and stuff. So trying to get a broad um, you know, idea around how people make sense of these things. Um, but really also looking at education and, and how we can create solutions. But honestly, out of that, just realizing the level of trauma and healing that needs to happen on, on multiple levels. Um, even myself, I'm healing, like we just saw, I'm just healing every day. Um, and that's the thing with, with these types of situations is um, there's no blueprint, right? It's, it's, a, it's a forever um, when we're dealing with these things. So I'm gonna start the conversation off. That's me, actually, I'm a grandmother too. Um, I, have, I have three children, my daughter started in high school and I think that's another big part of who I am. That's what fuels me. That's why I started my journey at BCC, you know, was my son. Um, and as, um, you know, as much as we do what we do, it's like family is, is really my fuel. Um, and now I have another grandson on the way. So our, fam our tribe is growing really fast. Um, but yes, um, so there are many dimensions to who I am. Um, there are many hats that I've worn. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm proud to be uh, an alum of Bristol Community College. Um, I am proud of this city. I love this city as much as it pains me. I almost lost people. I have lost people to some of the ailments of this city. Uh, addiction is major. Um, I've, I've suffered a lot here, you know, and I've had to, you know, face a lot of things. But at the end of the day, I stay grounded in those rich radical traditions and hope that our community can, can come back and really um, do some transformative healing things. Um, so, any questions or thoughts? Did I forget anything? Huh? Did I forget anything? I don't know. If I forgot anything, Eva, did I forget something? Did I? Um, I have a comment. One of, um, 
two thoughts. One, the Women's Center really wants to support parents and students because being a parent and going to school is really a struggle. Mm. Um, so we want to revive the parenting club. Actually, the New Bedford Teen Parenting Program came to visit, and we want to do it an annual thing that we have teen moms coming and saying this is a possibility. So, you know, that legacy continues. But mm. I think your story highlights a lot of different things. Um, one being that, you know, we live in a community that suffers a lot. And we see a lot of our young ones pass away to violence and other issues. And many times, as you said, we just have to isolate it and continue going, but that pain is real. And I think you exemplify how to not disregard that. Because yes, you continued on. And you know, it's an example with your dissertation that you know a lot of people don't use a murder case as an example, but you kept that real and you said, I'm gonna honor that. So I think that's just an awesome example of someone that will continue to sing your truth and then adapting to the environment that you live in. And you've always been true to who you are. And I think that's really meaningful. Thank you, and I'm, I'm so excited that you're doing that through the Women's Center, because that's very real, the whole um, parent in peace. Like, and, and I think, you know, even like through all my phases of education, I didn't feel, I always felt like I was the anomaly. You know what I mean? I didn't feel like those spaces were designed for me. Especially this dissertation process almost killed me. They say ABD, all but dissertation, I was all but dead. <laughs> Very close. And then I was just telling Colleen, like, I'm still coming out of the cave because my resources and my lifestyle was not the typical student. You know what I'm saying? Like, my, I had a backpack, my whole dissertation in a bag, and go to find spaces to read, to think, to write, unpack it all, pack it back up. I have a weird bond with my backpack now, it's in my car. I don't get, it's like we are one, you know what I mean? But like like my living room, I had to go to Colorado to my Kamatos just to, you know, and like the space, just space. Let's just talk about space. People have homes where they can go in their little office or they have actually professions where they can print out hundreds of things to, re like my circumstances were very different. I was lucky to have a fellowship from UMass. Um, but it was a very small amount of resources and I had to, I couldn't work full time. That was part of the guidelines. And if I did work full time, I wouldn't be here saying I finished. <laughs> um, I would be ABD and maybe even dead, I don't know. But um, <laughs> I think that it's important for, for institutions to understand and accommodate people who don't have these kinds of situations. There's this ideal student, and especially in grad school, and when you look at the demographics of people with PhDs, th they don't look like this. And a lot of it is, you know, like resources, you know? Um, and even some of the, the you know, <coughs> people don't have the same realities when you're going to class. You're like, oh, really, that's your struggle? Okay. <laughs> you know, um, when you're dealing with, when you're rooted in your community and the pressure because I'm com from the community, yeah. the pressure is on because this is a representation of us. Yeah. You know what I mean? This isn't just Jennifer getting her degree so she could move up. This is like, this. people were telling me this. Like, this is for us. You know what I'm saying? So there's just a whole bunch of different levels that go into it. Um, but it's great that you're recognizing that at the center and really trying to cultivate something, especially for young moms. Um, because education is the only way that I saw out of this. I didn't have, I have six figure debt right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm still trying to figure this out. There isn't like, oh, I get my PhD, everything's great. You know what I'm saying? Because I didn't have parents that had money put away, you know, waiting for, for this day. We, like I said, we never saw this day. College was not in the trajectory. You know what I'm saying? Why? Because our young kids think it's not for us. Because at very young, we are pushed out of those systems. Because we don't believe it's for us. You know what I mean? So I think as young, as young moms, or just in general, but that is one way you can get out of your situation. Especially BCC, because you don't walk out with all that debt. Like I walked out of. I'm like, geez. Hi, what's your name? Uh, my name is Kepra. Hi, Kepra. <laughs> um, Dr. JDB, I have a two-part question. Okay. The first is, what's next for you? So you gave us your history, and I'd really, really love to hear what's next. And then the second thing I would love to hear is, do you have a special message for a young person who's in the audience today, named Peyton, 
who is a leader who's concerned about her community, who feels very passionately like you, like what would you say to her about what's important for can her I, future? Can I start with that yeah, one? With that? Mm -hmm. Hi, Peyton. Hi, Jody. Um, So what I would say to you is one thing that gets erased out of the history of a lot of positive change is the power of young people. Um, a lot of people who made um, breakfast programs for, for, for kids in schools um, started that out as young people. Um, so as young as you are, you are very, very powerful. And if you feel it within yourself to do something, I say you create it, create it. And I think everything that I've created, like I said, I started out doing a dance troupe out of my car and eventually people were opening spaces, they were giving us money, like when you create it, I hate to sound biblical, but if you build it, it will come. Everything you need will come. The people you need, the resources you need. So I think keep that fire alive because there'll be a lot of people who tell you you're too young or you're so cute. Like keep that fire bright and burning. There are a lot of people in town putting that fire out. So keep it strong. I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> and I think that's the biggest thing for me. It's like the journey more than it is the outcome. I really try to stay grounded. I'm really not grounded yet. I'm still coming out of the cave. Um, but I think and if, as long as I can stand in my truth and go with the flow, I'm where I'm supposed to be. And that's how I ended up at Treatment on Demand. I was supposed to be in a doctor's office, <laughs> uh, you know, and I think that I'm always going to be where I'm supposed to be. I mean, there's definitely, you know, some decisions I can make. It's not like, oh, out to the whims of life. But I just try not to get too fixated. Because every time I design an idea, yeah. usually doesn't. Yeah. It gets close, but it's usually, oh, I got to learn that lesson this time. <laughs> you know, it's really a journey. It's a process. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's the lesson in that. That could be the third takeaway that it's really about the process and the journey and the people um, like Maria back there. Um, she's been part of the journey. I don't even know how long uh, since I started this journey. Um, so I think, yeah, it's really about the people and, and the process. Um, yeah, along the way. That's what shapes you. I have a comment, Jennifer, uh, speaking back to your, 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 your notion of being an artist, right? <laughs> I feel like you have always been an artist. When you, when you consider what motivates artists, it's love, mm. right? And I feel like your, your, your life experiences, your, your journey, the way you strive in life, it's always been driven by love. Mm -hmm. and that makes you an artist, right? And this, this kind of echoes uh, Cornel West. I mm. kept remembering his saying about I think he was inspired by MLK. He said, um, "Justice is what uh, love, love looks, looks like." like. In public, yes. Right? Yes. So you're driven by justice. You're driven by your community, and those are all part of your life. And I think you, you reflect on them with love, and that that makes you an artist. You know, whatever you do, uh, you, you engage it with with feeling. You talk about feelings all the time. You express feelings right here. Um, that's love, mm -hmm. and I think that, that makes you an artist with, with whatever you engage in, right? So you've always been an artist. Yeah, I think I, I, think I don't do well with labels. Right. You know, I think that's the issue is that I don't like to put myself in a box. Even right. when people like, you're an activist, you're this, I'm like, eh, I gotta find my own, I don't know. <laughs> There's just so many layers, right, to who we are, and I think sometimes because we put labels on people, it puts them in a box and people think certain things, yeah. so I, I try not to, I'll say I'm an artist, and then people are like, oh, well, can you perform? And, and no, <laughs> you know, or she's not a real artist, like what records did she sell? Or, I don't know, but it's like, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on labels, I'm just trying to be Jennifer. You know, and whatever expression that is at the day, like sometimes it's a, a crazy mom and sometimes it's a leader and sometimes it's, you know, you know, many different things. Anytime so you engage life with love, you're an artist. Absolutely. And, and then like with Che, you know, right. Che Quivera, mm -hmm. a revolutionary is, is, you know, exactly. Love is the source of everything. 
So yeah, any questions, thoughts, ideas from some of the students here? What are your struggles? What are you dealing with right now? Don't stop. <laughs> Lack of sleep. Oh, can I, I know that story. I know that story very well. And you're in finals right now, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm teaching at Rhode Island College and my students are like so checked out. <laughs> and I'm like, kind of like, ooh, I can feel you. Um, but just stay the course. But yeah, that's, that's one of the things um, that I feel like was most challenging. I think I'm just starting to get back to a regular sleep schedule. Um, because I feel, what'd you say? A what? A regular sleep schedule. Oh, 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 yeah, like what sleep? Exists. Right. Oh. It, it's real. It happens. <laughs> oh, oh. Um. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, and there's still times I'm up, like there's still battles with that, but I just feel like it's like so much happening that we're trying to process. And I think I'm not trying to celebrate lack of sleep because it's not honorable. You know what I'm saying? And I think what, I, what I've learned so much is that we really need to implement self-care. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's hard lesson to learn when you're older. Um, and you know, a lot of times we're so used to what everybody else is doing and stuff, but I, I'm starting to learn that, like, how do we implement that in? Um, because we live in a society that so like celebrates, sacrifice yourself, like take your arm off, take your hair out, whatever you gotta do, just produce, 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 to be a robot, a machine. And I think the more that we, you know, honor our, ourselves and take care of ourselves, we're kind of, you know, changing the culture. We're changing the way society works and we start to do that for ourselves. So I think it's important to really, I, and I know that somebody was telling me that while I was at, I'm like, yeah, yeah, sounds good. I'll be up at four or five listening to the birds, but it's really important to try even eating, you know? taking that, those steps to really be in touch with your body and like taking care of your body. Because what do you have to carry you through? Your body is your temple, so try to get some sleep. Just try it tonight for me. Um, but just stay the course though. Stay the course as, as a student, like just keep pushing. Don't give up. I was, I'm part of this group um, for people who are getting their dissertations or degrees and um, someone just posted how their mom passed away and their partner just lost their child at 31 weeks, you know, being pregnant and um, just like wanted to just throw it all away, you know what I mean? And it's, it's really hard when you're doing these things because some people don't, like, I find that it's hard to talk about being in school when people are not in it, you know what I mean? That's why I'm like, I want to really talk to you students because it's, it's a real thing especially when you come from families if you're first generation of a family that didn't go to college yeah. and your peers didn't go to college it's a different situation for me though what is yours like i am an art major mm. yes but, uh, my, good um, my like everyone in my family like my dad and like his siblings and everything like they all got like degree degrees, like with like six figure jobs now, or like the government and stuff like that. And all their kids are like going to be like doctors and nurses, and they're like in like good good schools, like somewhere away from like they move over New York now. They're on like the Long Island schools, and like it's all like it's kind of like I'm kind like they have kind of already like because of what I want to pursue and because of the things I'm interested in. My family's already kind of seen me as like she's not doing anything right. Like, uh, like kind of disappointment. Like my dad wants me out of the house soon because he thinks I'm care about things that aren't real, even though like I work full time too. So I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm trying, uh, but it's been like, so I'm just kind of different than like who I came from. Even but they're wow, successful, yeah. but I'm. I want to be successful too, but you know, it's only, only one way to get there too. You know what I mean? But it, what so is it, success, yeah. right? I think it's hot, that label thing, right? Yeah. Like what is really success for you? Like t success for me was getting here today yeah. and so being present. You know so what I mean? Like how do we measure it? There's a lot of pressure on me to be something I'm not, to attain like the family kind of image and like to be part of the, you know, <laughs> and it's just kind of gross. Yeah, that's a unique struggle, but I think it's, 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 for whatever reason, this is who you are. And I, I would say the same thing to you that I said to Peyton. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, don't dull your fire. Like, you, you are he you're here for a purpose. 
And I like like Ingen was saying, like is driven by love. It's it's about humanity. It's a powerful medium to educate, to transform people. And now is the time for art. Like it's really being embraced across the board a lot more. You know, then it ha I don't I know. I plans with what I want to do too. I'm getting an apprenticeship for certain things over the summer and stuff. Like, I have ideas. It's just, it's not what they're used to seeing. That's fine. You didn't come here for them. Yeah. You're here for you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Change in your family. <laughs> and then later on, they're going to be like, oh, we have the artist in the family and she's so <laughs> successful. <laughs> so, yeah, don't get stuck in that because there's, there's, things will change. But it's also motivation, right? Yeah. Uh, so many people. I come from like my family is like super privileged because of their background and like they're all immigrated from like like very like <coughs> rich Western like European countries like you know and like during the eras like that were like the harsh eras then so it was like during World War Two and stuff they came over and mm. everything so it was a very different kind of backstory from like what I grew up around versus like I feel like other people like, in contact with around here did. And it kind of people isolated from my peers too because of that, and it's just like it's really confusing sometimes, it's like being the person I am with the background I have and like where I live. Like it's just like a, I feel like it's kind of mismatched, but like it's it can't be wrong. Like, like it's my uh, life. Yeah, right. yeah. I think I think the person I am and where I came from. I think you're always gonna be, you know, like who you are. You know what I mean? But at the same time, you create your own reality. Um, and define it for yourself. You know, it's definitely different, but I think um, even though your, your background's different, it's the same for a lot of people here. Because yeah. a lot of people here are doing things their families aren't doing, whether it's from privileged or unprivileged places. Yeah. Would you be willing to talk a little bit about um, how you were transformed during the process of your oral history project? I mean, this is a, the, the mm. murder of Malcolm Gr you know, was you had feelings and and going into the project, right? And so your project was about making sense of how people made sense of um, the, the incident and, and the reality. Can you talk a little bit, would you mind sharing of how, whether it changed the way you thought about the, the process, you learned something about yourself, you learned something about um, the community that you didn't know before, maybe? I think, um, again, like, I just want to preface this with I'm still coming out of the cave. Sure. I just finished in January and the process was really long, um, and uh, the journey was really hard um, because it's it's part of me. It's an, it's part of me. It's it, like a lot of people have different topics and their dissertations that are very separate from them, you know. And um, I, the proximity was very close. Um, so I think one of the the things um, what I thought was interesting is that I did have ideas of what I thought happened. Um, and as I was going through the process, like the fa the community was echoing things um, that are now coming, like being, it, it became like an expose, kind of, if that makes sense. Um, that, and this isn't a personal transformation, but I feel like the project started to unveil things because there's a civil case right now. And I, if you see announcements about hearings and stuff, I really recommend people go because this is real. Um, this is happening in New Bedford and um, it's important that people understand what's going on. Um, but I think, um, understand, I, I didn't, hmm. I, I can't, I'm not sure how to answer that. I think the transformation for me, I'm still, I, a lot of healing, like I'm trying to heal and um, I feel like, I feel the community needs, a, a lot needs to happen in the community around it. Um, and understanding like the erasure of, of what's happened and how things have changed. Um, but, but the main theme I think I pulled out of it is really trying to find ways of coping and healing um, is so important right now, I think, um, myself, for myself and for my community. Um, but I thought, I, it, it's just really powerful, like having people's stories and hearing their stories and all the different elements that they bring to it um, and, and all of the themes that come out of it and the truths. You know, the, the thing is for me, it was, helping to facilitate a way for, for voices to be heard that haven't been heard. 
you have the, the newspaper has an interesting story, which is not truth. Um, and then, you know, the, the reports have its, has its story, um, but you don't hear what the story was um, from people who were there. And I think, um, and telling our stories is healing in itself. It's, it's an African black feminist tradition, you know what I mean? So I think um, bringing up that, those traditions and, and, and incorporating that into the, the legacies of, of the community um, was really important, but creating that space. Um, so actually, you know, um, one of the things I'm hoping to do is to turn it into an audio book um, where the stories can be heard because uh, nobody's gonna wanna read a dissertation. Um, <laughs> some people have, big ups to everybody who has read it, um, but I think uh, trying to make it a presentation back to the community and publish the dissertation as a book. I imagine even knowing or thinking you know when to even stop must be problematic because this is it doesn't. What's going on. My last chapter is The Never Ending Conclusion. That's the title of the actual chapter. Is it really? The Never Ending Conclusion because it doesn't end. There is no stop. And I think that's probably my weakest chapter because um, I think that it's hard. Like, where do you put a start and an end to this? Because even with Malcolm, like, it wasn't May uh, 17th that this began. This goes back to the 70s or even before the 70s. There's a history of surveillance. There's a history of repression in this community. So you can't just say, oh, boom, me, da 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 da. We don't start history. Where do we start history? Where do we end it? You know? So someone, I mean, people are getting killed every day. You know? So I, I don't know. This, and that's, that was my challenge. Like, I was supposed to finish before I did, but I'm like, how do I, even for myself, how do I stop something? that has no end and be hopeful in that. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I answered that. That was tricky. Colleen. <laughs> I wasn't trying. Nah. I don't know if I answered that. Anybody else? No? What are you, what are you studying right now? Nice. That was my original major too. Yeah. How about you? Uh, general studies. Do you think you're, you're going to transfer out? How about you? Me. Yeah. General studies. General studies. You you plan on transferring? Do you know yeah. where you're going to transfer to? I'm only a freshman. I haven't really thought about it. Okay. It's not only. <laughs> it's a big thing to be a freshman. <laughs> you're starting your journey. How about you? Do you know what you're going to do? Um, I want to go to Bridgewater for social work. Awesome. Yes. Um, I, in retrospect, <laughs> I hate to say this, um, but, but I think I should have did that. <laughs> um, you know, as coming out of this whole, like, thing, and the, my degree is educational leadership and policy studies, and it really puts me in a box yeah. in terms of what I can do, in a sense, um, where with the MSW, it's really limitless of what you can do. So that's a really, really wise choice. So big ups on that. Yes, yes, yes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate you.